Well, aloha mai kako, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, this evening. My name is Troy Andrade, and I'm a law professor and director of the Ululehua Scholars Program at the William S. Richardson School of Law. On behalf of the Lehua Program, the King Kamehameha V Judiciary History Center, Kahuliao Center for Excellence in Native Hawaiian Law, and the Richardson Alumni Association, it really is my pleasure to welcome you to this special event. Now, while the remarks shared today don't necessarily represent the opinions of the judiciary, it's really important to recognize Chief Justice Mark Rechtenwald, the Hawaii State Judiciary, State Legislature for their continued support of the History Center and the law school's missions, which really provides a venue for this discussion and many wonderful programs that we put together throughout the year. A bit of housekeeping before we get started. After the discussion, there will be time for me to ask our speakers some questions. So please, during this presentation, uh, use the Q&A function at the bottom of our Zoom webinar screen here to ask your questions of our speaker. Also a friendly reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Judiciary History Center's YouTube channel and website by the end of the day. A direct link to the recording will be shared with everyone who registered and a short feedback survey will be sent out tomorrow. We really appreciate your comments to help assess the programming and encourage you to fill it out. I wanted to take this time to also extend a special thanks to Brianna Govea, the program specialist for the History Center, as well as third year law student and Ululehua scholar, Madonna Castro Perez for helping to put this program together. So now to the main show. Tonight you are in for a, a really special treat as you will hear and learn from an acclaimed indigenous international human rights lawyer and writer. He is the founder of Blue Ocean Law, a progressive firm that works at the intersection of indigenous rights and environmental justice. He is a brilliant, soulful, and deeply engaged in the struggles of peoples across Oceania to liberate themselves from colonial rule, defend their sacred sites, and obtain justice for a range of harms inflicted upon them by outside forces, from nuclear weapons testing to non-consensual medical experimentation to issues of climate change. He serves on the Global Advisory Council of Progressive International, a global collective that launched in May 2020 with the mission of mobilizing progressive forces around the world behind a shared vision of social justice. A graduate of our very own Richardson Law School, he is a legend in the hallways and classrooms of our campus. He has written several books with his most recent being published this year called The Properties of Perpetual Light, which Pulitzer Prize winning author Alice Walker called, quote, a powerful and beautiful book. It's fierce love of the land, the ocean, the elders and the ancestors warms the heart and moves the spirit. International law professor Richard Falk said, the, said this about the book, quote, inspired spiritual and practical wisdom from a Guam lawyer, poet, seer that transmits ways of knowing, feeling, and acting, which speak directly to the mind and heart of everyone on the planet. If reading this short book doesn't change your life, nothing will, end quote. I've known our speaker since I was a law student over a decade ago um, and have admired his passion and his work. A couple of years ago, I was fortunate to spend a few days really getting to know our speaker in Kuala Lumpur, of all places. Uh, we shared really good stories over good food, often in the lobby of a hotel, and had some really, really good laughs. With that, it is my distinct honor and true privilege to turn the virtual microphone over to lawyer, writer, and my dear friend, Julian Uggen. Thank you so much, Troy. I really appreciate that. Very warm and generous introduction. Um, I'll just start with um, a really short reading from the book. Um, this is one of the first entries and it's one of the shortest as well. Um, this is called Go With The Moon. Go with the moon, my godfather says. He's a taladzeru, meaning he throws net and he knows things. Like what time of year the minyahak run, which is the actual question I asked. Seriously, Nino, I say. Seriously, he says, you get your gear ready in April because that's the first run. Late April into early May, you get seven days, maybe 10, but that's it. So you got to be ready. Then he self-corrects, tells me those months don't matter, not really anyway. Tells me for the second time that what matters is the moon, the last quarter moon, the real thin one. That's the one we want, he says his voice trailing, his eyes fixed on a grayish blob moving in the distance. I don't ask any more questions, just watch. 
watch the gray blob, which is really a school of baby rabbit fish, come into focus. Watch a quiet man grow even more quiet. Watch a white net spread itself out like a circular dream and drop. And I'm in awe. Never ever have I seen something so quiet be so alive. Thank you. Um, so yeah, Troy, I figured um, this session could be really conversational and I'm hoping you have tons of questions for me, uh, both about um, my work as a lawyer and the work we do with my team at Blue Ocean Law, um, as well as the book. I'm pretty much an open book, so hit it. So that was a, a great, one of my favorite pieces out of your whole uh, a book. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about about this particular piece and maybe a couple other pieces that you may wanna highlight. Sure, um, this piece is one of like three or four that are written with the same kind of voice, you know? Um, they're really nostalgic and they, they like, I attempted to transport the reader back in time um, in like basically to various childhood memories I had growing up here because Guam is such a, you know, a restingly beautiful place. Um, and with everything that was happening when I was writing the book, uh, which was in 2020 um, with a global pandemic, you know, um, just with um, an alarmingly high rate of suicide, including youth suicide in Guam. I think when I was writing it, it was one suicide every six days. It was really alarming. And, um, and it was just, it, it all felt so noisy, um, you know, not just COVID, but also, you know, we have um, underway, uh, rather rapid and enormous um, military build up here. So it's it, these were sort of like jar, these just gigantic forces were sort of afoot, you know? And uh, I started reaching for all of these memories because I, I started realizing, I think I have to write a different kind of book, a book that's capable of reminding people what it is exactly that we have here, you know? Um, I think sometimes, you know, when we're locked into framing, um, of issues and we're just locked in such such an adversarial sort of framework you know like when we're locked in oppositional framing of everything it it becomes really hard in some ways to have a conversation with each other at least one that's meaningful and one that's capable of building bridges across that divide you know especially the ideological divide and i and i i just started writing in this really particular way and the writing in this book i would argue more than all my previous writings, um, the writing is um, remarkably quiet. And I think that's makes this book distinct. Um, I've written before, but never so quietly. And I realized like I really wanted to write in such a fashion where I forced the reader to almost physically lean in to the book. I wanted to whisper so that they have to lean in to hear me, you know? And I think that kind of writing is capable of doing something that some of the other writing, you know, including legal scholarship can't do, you know? I think that's, I think that's so um, powerful. And one, one of the things that I appreciated about all of the different stories that you were telling were that they were relatable. They were things that even in Hawaii, we see, you know, little tree snails, little butterflies, sand that looks like stars, right? Little tiny things that you've just captured in this way to make us really think about, you know, you remember Professor Yamamoto, like what's what's at stake, right? Like what's really going on in this conversation to, to be able to address things like militarism and tourism and all of those things. So I really appreciated that. Um, that aspect of your book, which is again, like you said, really different from the, the, the legal stuff that us lawyers are used to reading and writing about. Um, if you were to describe your book, let's say in one or two words or a phrase, what, what would, how, how would you describe your book? Um, I, I, Recently, um, when I was um, being interviewed by The Nation, who um, really generously- um, Oh, you know, just being interviewed by The Nation. No, no way. <laughs> There's a, the journalists there were, um, I don't know, they read the book and loved it and they were really generous with their write-up. Um, but I, I caught myself saying this and I think it, it still applies. Um, I, I see the book in some ways as a bridge, you know? It seeks to lay itself down 
so that young people and particularly young people who are in search of meaning, but also in search of language, in search of the, the words with which to graft their will upon the world, you know, including graft their rage onto the world, you know, the fullness of self, young people who have so much to say and who are thinking and such have such deeply, you know, um, thoughtful and rich interior lives, but they don't have the sort of access to the language they need to graft that in a meaningful way onto, you know, onto the world. I feel like this book is a bridge for them. It helps them make a crossing. It helps them cross really difficult terrain. I mean, I think that's what we are all sort of living with, right? This, we are faced with just um, not only just enormous odds, but just like the ground we're walking on, you know, it's, it's, it really is tough terrain. And, and I think in some ways the book sort of acts like a bridge um, and what could argue maybe even a soft landing, um, even for activists, even for like young people who see themselves as change agents and who wish to be so. You know, they wish to change the world and they believe, you know, they share my very stubborn belief that, that you know, that what we love, we can save. You know, young people in that position, they need a boost sometimes, you know, they need to know, you know, like, and I, and, I, and the book does some of that, you know, like I don't. You know, now when you're an adult and you've accomplished a certain number of things and you've done most of what you want to do with the law, like I feel personally, like I've done most of what I want to do with this, with the profession. I feel like for the last 10 years, I've been really focused on doing sort of like everything I wanted to do with it, you know, and I'm not saying I'm done, but I'm saying in some ways when you're, when you arrive at sort of this stage of life, right, you, it's easy to look back and lie to yourself and others, that it was an easy road getting there, you know, like, no, but I struggled, you know, I profoundly, you know, and I understand what it is to be a young person reaching for my words and them not being there, you know, and so like this book in some ways is a photograph with, with words, a photograph of me out of step, slouching, profoundly unsure of myself. Um, and I think young people need that. I think they need that kind of conversation. And I think that kind of conversation is more authentic than the one that th that's on offer. Wow, thanks for that. I mean, we've been getting some questions, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep firing away. Um, the, sure. the, one of the things that I found really beautiful are your footnotes. <laughs> and you know, as a law professor, you kind of dig into the footnotes a little bit. And you really use the footnotes, do some really, you know, add an extra layer to what it is that you were um, trying to get across. Any footnotes stand out in particular as one that you? Well, I'll ask you the same question. Any footnotes stood out at you or jumped out at you as being a little alarming or surprising or? Well, I, I specifically appreciated all the footnotes where you bring in all the references, all your literary mm -hmm. references, right? And yeah. your literary um, you know, heroes into this, this story. So again, that you're serving like that bridge. Um, so it's fascinating to see, you know, your connections and kind of bringing together a lot of different worlds into this one little book. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I think the footnotes were just my attempt to eliminate all the distance between the writer and the reader. Because, I mean, the book is already intimate. You know, I'm already sort of sharing, one could argue oversharing, just about my life story. And but also I'm doing so for a reason. I'm really it's it's less about my life, even if it's all about my life. And it's more about yours, the readers. It's like, it, if I don't, I, it's not so direct, but I think one, it, it's subtle. But once you read, get, read your way through the entire thing, um, you realize that I'm inviting you. It's like the swinging open of a door. I'm inviting the reader to walk in with all of their baggage and all of their uncertainty, you know, and, and all of their imperfection and just like, and the way that they, they struggle with identity and language you know, all of these things. And so I think the footnote was an opportunity to really eliminate that distance. And again, it comes back to like some, um, I guess this very, you know, one of my most enduring impulses, not only as a scholar, but as a writer and as a human being is just to cut the shit, you know? I mean, not to cuss, but I mean, but basically to stop hiding, stop pretending, stop being fancy, you know, and also stop, just stop. You know, like stop like hiding behind all of these sort of things that we do. We we have a I don't know spectacular ability to erect every kind of wall, 
to distance ourselves between, oh, wow, I'm seeing lots of things from Jocelyn right now. <laughs> okay, but we have, we erect these walls between each other, you know, and like these fortresses, these impenetrable things. And I was like, wow, we are way more porous than we believe. We have to transcend these borders and we have to be able to talk to each other. So the footnotes were really an attempt to, um, to like gain or earn intimacy with the reader. I um, mean, you know, and of course, yes, one of the things I did was bring in tons of writers that I love you know, like tons of writers whose work um, really nourished me for one reason or another. Um, yeah, but I think that's important. I, I would try to reference them as points of light, you know, that can I, I think that's in a way. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. And I think the, I found the book to be so accessible to get to your point, right? Which is so important, um, especially when you're in the legal world, at least for me, to ensure that people everyday people, not just judges, not just lawyers, understand the consequences and understand um, what's at stake, right? Um, I'll pull in a question from the audience right now. What else do you think, aside from this beautiful book that you've just written, what else do you wish to accomplish professionally and or personally? We haven't talked about your lawyer job generally? yet. We'll get just to that. Generally? Yeah, aside from winning the Nobel Peace Prize, which I'm going to put that on that you're going to do that in one soon enough that's going to be you you're crazy <laughs> um no i just oh, honestly i this this is not i don't know i hope this doesn't sound flippant troy and i i, I I'm, I'm really um treating your ser question seriously but honestly i do really feel like i've done a lot um in the law you know i, I and i'm happy i feel like the work that we do um is it's just really meaningful and so I don't know, I feel consistently empowered about, you know, the world, despite all of the sort of like, I mean, my God, we just had another intergovernmental panel, you know, on climate change report and IBC's report that just, you know, like really sobered us. And I, and I understand the stakes are devastatingly high. And I know that we're doing that, but when you're on the ground and you're working in community, you know, in solidarity with other people who are trying to you know, arrest, you know, the spread, you know, of death and destruction. And you're doing that in community with others, you feel very alive. Um, so I feel like, you know, I feel like the work we do is really meaningful and I really wouldn't change anything about it. Um, I'm really happy with, with sort of what we're doing. Um, but yeah, just being, I think I'm open to um, change. I'm open to, you know, other experiences. Um, maybe, maybe do some more international litigation. Um, with some other groups. Um, I think there's opportunities to really explicitly link the international climate change regime with the international human rights one. Um, you know, like we have these, like, like I think like multiple bodies of law can be more, um, I don't know, I think they, we, they have things to say to each other, but they're not necessarily sort of engaged in like a cross fertilization. And I can see that happening. And I see it happening with some groups. And I think I would do all of those things. Um, but I'm not, but I could also walk away from the law at this point too and not be sad about it. And I know that sounds odd because I haven't practiced for 20 years. Um, you know, it's, it's been less than 20, but I've done most of what I wanted to do. Yeah, no, and I think you've done some, I mean, really amazing things in the span of your, your professional uh, legal career. Um, let's rewind a little bit. You spent okay. some time here in Hawaii. Yes. Um, Tell me about that experience here in Hawaii and how, if at any, it helped shape the work you do or it helped shape, you know, who you are, professional Julian and who you are, personal Julian. No, sure. Uh, no, Hawaii just massively informed who I am. I mean, you know, I, I couldn't love, you know, your ancestral homeland more. I mean, honestly, I mean, just as a law student, you know, uh, I wrote this in one of the footnotes, obviously, you know, I was like, for the activist turned law student, you know, uh, having like an intellectual home uh, where people understand that the law is not neutral because it is always already a moving train. And Howard Zinn teaches us that you can't be neutral on those things, you know, <laughs> having understood that, you know, and coming to law school, not so much as a, a very young person aspiring to figure out who I am, but a fully formed person who went to law school to gather a particular set of skills to deploy it in service of collective liberation, you know, like as someone like that, um, it's important to have an intellectual home. And for me, that was Kahuliao. So like Professor Sproat, you know, Serrano, 
um, Mackenzie, but also other professors were like hugely helpful to me in my own intellectual journey. Linda Hamilton Krieger, just to name one of them. Um, just a huge influence, you know. I'm gonna live in just multiple other professors, but also just, but it's not just about the school, you know. So much of the richness about being in law school in Hawaii is, is the environment, is the culture, is the island, is everyone else, you know, honestly. Um, my, I have some of the best friends. I mean, some of them are on this call right now, you know, like Jocelyn and Deja. And I, I don't know, I could just go off, you know, Kate, Kate, Brian Greenwood. I mean, there's so many people who we just suffer through it together. And I say suffer through it because, you know, it's, it's a lie to say it's just, you know, cake. It's like a walk on the beach. It's difficult. It's, and it's especially difficult for people, you you know, for whom the law is a means to an end. We understand that it's a tool and that can, it's a tool that can be used with people with both good and bad intentions, you know? And it, it's just, that's what it is. And if you lose the illusion, if you allow yourself to burn the illusion, you know, that we have, that the law is more than that. You know, once we get out of that God awful formalist framing of what law is, you know, then we're free. We're free to manipulate it as we wish. You know, we're free to deploy it, you know, in service of this like larger liberatory project, you know? Um, so I love working with like people all over the world and I do. And I think that Troy, that's why I feel so blessed. I feel honestly very lucky because I actually on a daily basis am in conversation, a global conversation with other human rights lawyers, indigenous rights lawyers who are environmental justice lawyers who are actively implementing the norms of international law. We don't just talk about them, but they're on the ground, you know, and they're sweaty and they're in the trenches and they're, you know, implementing these ideas. The work that we do is exceedingly concrete. And I think that's why I feel so hopeful, honestly. If I, if I wasn't doing such concrete work in the world, I wouldn't be this hopeful. I would probably be more cynical. Like so many other law professors are cynical, no offense. Not to you, obviously, but we know, we know that this profession also breeds a kind of cynicism and it's, it's tragic. And we have to work against that. Those who see, especially because we have sort of, we're participating in shaping, you know, young people's minds and they need to know, you know, what is possible so much bigger than what they've been told. Yeah. And I think your book accomplishes that. I mean, I think it's, it's, I, I, I sent a copy to all of my first year Lehua scholars and they've read it. We had a beautiful conversation today about your book and everybody raved about it. Um, and I think it should be required reading, especially at our law school, because it does that beautiful job of anchoring people. I mean, although yours is anchored really in Guam, right? And the struggles in Guam, but it's so relatable and personal um, and helps students to remember that there's more to this world than just reading a textbook and reading a case and interpreting it in a certain way, right? There's this, I keep saying the word beauty, right? But there's this beauty that we have to not forget. And I, and oh, I found that for like- For sure. And honestly, Troy though, but being, you, we're, you know, our students, and I can say our, right? Because I'm still an adjunct, you know, I teach specifically on legal systems there, but our students are really fortunate because they're uniquely situated. Like I remember- really clearly being in water law, you know, with um, Kapua Sprout and being in Maui and working on like, she, because she, because she's doing the damn thing. She's not just, you know, oh, let me come in here and be in this room and the universe falls away. No, she's in community with people trying to restore water. You know, but these are real, so we meet people, like we had a clinic, we met people, we understand exactly why we're doing what we're doing, you know, because the law sometimes delivers justice, you know, you know, rarely by design and only on occasion, but sometimes it does, you know? And when you're a part of that and you can see the possibility, you know, then you get inspired. And I think that's why clinics like that it, are so important. You know, I think, I mean, honestly, like we need more clinics maybe, you know, and also ones that aren't only Asian focused, but Pacific Island focused, you know, and there's a real difference. Um, the Pacific Island region is so wildly under-examined from a human rights point of view. Um, many of our issues are human rights issues, and we need a clinic for it. I love that. Let's so let's go there. Tell me about the work that you've done after you know after Kahulia, after law school. You went mm -hmm. back home, and now you've been engaged for a number of years now in really great work. Tell me, you know, maybe a, about a case or um, the type of work that you're doing. Sure. Um, 
Okay, so just sort of thematically, right? We can break it down like <laughs> Blue Ocean Law, we work on self-determination, you know, the fundamental right of self-determination, but we know it has two components, really, a political and an economic component. So in Guam and the CNMI, we have either wrote amicus or we've actually led delegation throughout for like t almost a decade in federal courts in the case Davis versus Guam, where we were trying to defend the right of the native inhabitants of Guam to exercise self-determination, politically speaking. Um, in French Polynesia, I spent a good amount of time, me and my team in Tahiti and other islands and actually examining uh, like a wide range of French laws and policies that impact the sort of economic component of self-determination and really sort of are working to subrogate the right in that context. Um, we also, we have, we work with other lawyers who support the international lawyers for West Papua. West Papua remains um, a colony um, that is both colonized and militarily occupied by Indonesia and Indonesia presently is committing a wide range of human rights violations. Um, so we are calling for like the UN special rapporteurs to have a visiting mission there. Oh, speaking of that, we also just um, secured a, a joint allegation letter from several UN special rapporteurs offices. These are mandate holders. These are essentially um, independent human rights experts. You know, and they, you know, and that was really quite great because we, you know, the Guam has went to the UN for decades with very little to show for it. Um, this is actually um, a letter that was directed to the Biden administration outlining a number of rights violations, including the viola um, the alleged violation of the right to free prior and informed consent with respect to the buildup here in Guam. We've worked on regional issues at large. So like um, there's this new extractive industry called deep sea mining. Sometimes it's called seabed mining. And essentially this is, essentially multinational corporations and countries alike are scrambling to the bottom of the seafloor um, and to these hydrothermal vents located in the benthic or very like low um, at, um, parts of the sea. And they are trying to scramble to get the mineral wealth. You know, there's three major types of mineral deposits there. Um, and these are things that go into like your iPhones, you know, this is like, so there's a lot, there's a, there's a staggering amount of wealth at the bottom of the ocean, but it particularly has consequence for the peoples of the Pacific, precisely because the Clarion Clipperton fracture zone is actually right around all of these EEZs of Pacific Island countries. So we've really worked to problematize how this industry has proceeded with insufficient safeguards, both um, safeguards on a purely environmental sort of perspective. So the precautionary principle, the principle to avoid transboundary harm, as well as the more sort of nascent but emerging international legal norms like free prior informed consent. Because communities in Papua New Guinea and Fiji and Tonga, for example, have already experienced a range of adverse impacts from the pre-mining also called the exploratory phase of deep sea mining. So we've been sort of involved in like str people struggles across <laughs> everything sounds like. no no it's just well we just are very I don't know I feel like we're very blessed because you know like we have you know earned the trust of communities and we were and we'd never you know impose our will like you know good little neo-imperialists we actually like, work in community with uh community-based organizations and activist groups um, women's groups um, who bring the problem to us, you know, to a wide range, a, a huge collective of human rights lawyers. And often we work with all kinds of law firms. At this point, um, I guess say we've worked with law firms all around the world, um, major environmental organizations, nonprofits, and straight up big law <laughs> as well, because they have pro bono, you know, arms to their operations. And so we, we work together. But I think that's, again, Troy, I think that's why I still teach, you know, um, just because I, I feel like I've had access to sort of like another world view that's so clearly alive. And I feel like our students, Richardson students need to see that in action. They don't need to just hear about, they need to, you know, we need to show them, not just tell them what it looks like to be a practitioner, what it looks like to try to implement international human rights legal norms on the ground, you know, whether it's through litigation or not. Yeah, so I, I I love all of this, by the way. Um, I'm interested in that community advocacy piece, right? How do you how do you do that? How do you build that trust? And particularly outside of Guam, right? For you, how do you build that trust with communities so that they 
basically entrust you with helping them. I don't, honestly, I think it, it's, it's, it's even a bigger question. I think I attribute like the, my success, the success of our law firm um, almost, almost exclusively to two things, you know, relationships and intuition. Honestly, for me, I have been guided by a very clear ideological North Star. And that is like, I view my relationships as relational, not as transactional. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I feel like people can see that, like people can feel that. It's hard to explain precisely, but when you are engaged and you work in community with people who view the world and relationships in particular as relational, as opposed to transactional, you feel the difference. You know, like we're and we're in it together. And I think part of why I've earned the trust of different communities only because like we, I, I'm, you know, it, struggling too, like here in the region, you know, it's not like, you know, you flit around um, like as an outside ally who just shows up, you know, and, and part of that work is just common sense. You know, it's also listening first before you start talking. I think it's super basic, but wow, people do not do that. I mean, still, we talk about it, but I have seen it in action too. And it's pretty jarring to watch um, outside legal counsel just show up with all the solutions before they've even really had a community conversation. It's pretty maddening um, to watch. And I guess, you know, over time you just build a reputation, you know, um, like we, and also you have to like, go around and you also have to take bar exams. So it's also like the unromantic work have become, you know, like gathering licenses and like all of that, you know, so yeah, but yeah, relationships and intuition. I think that those are sort of the key ingredients to whatever success that we've had. But what I'm hearing you say is that that success, all, all of the struggles were worth it. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Oh, for sure. I mean, there's no, no doubt. That is, oh. We all need to be like Julian. That is amazing. Okay, so I'm going to pull some questions from the uh, Q and A. How sure. about this one, which relates back to you being in Hawaii for a little bit? Yeah. What was your experience being Micronesian in Hawaii? How can things improve for the Micronesian community specifically in Hawaii? Oh man, there's just that's such a hard topic now because I mean it's so well. First of all. I have to situate myself in the context that I come from, being a Chamorro from Guam. Many of my own people forget that we are Micronesian. That is the first problem. I, I really tackle that squarely or pretty much head on in the book because I am just trying like, y'all need to pump the brakes on that. Like Chamorros are Micronesians. Um, and I think that has been the most annoying thing, just dealing with my own community, you know, sort of like that conversation. So that's the first one, but also just, um, I have always felt comfortable within Micronesian communities. Um, like, you know, I, uh, and I've been to so many of the islands. That's the other thing. I think that's part of my ability to be in the places now as a professional, because I understand how, what the place is, the vibe of the place. And I understand a, a significant amount about the culture and the people of the different Micronesian islands. So I, of course, I embrace it so wholeheartedly, you know, but being in Hawaii is tough for Micronesians, especially because there's so much, there's just so much discrimination. I mean, you know, and it's not just like, wow. I mean, I don't know, this is too big of a question in some ways, you know, we don't have enough time, but it's not just like the racial discrimination, it's economic discrimination. And there's so many, there's so many things that are happening that we don't name. For example, sometimes Guam and Hawaii, right? Um, it, when it comes down to the issue of compact impact funding, we have this conceptual inability to point the blame in the proper direction. So we place a disproportionate amount of the blame on each other when actually some of these problems are irrefutably American in origin. You know, part of the problem is like Congress woefully inadequately funding, not funding to sufficient levels, you know, the, the Hawaii or Guam, you know? So like there's like a, like a lot of, a lot of these issues, but we don't actually um, blame the U.S. first, you know, and actually engage in, and right now, like if, if, if allies, like if there were something that allies could do right now, as we speak, as opposed to just lamenting about the problems, I would say this, if you're not going to start a clinic, at least start some sort of group, like a, a loose collective of individuals who are allies to Micronesian states and see, especially if you can provide some pro bono legal services to the, the three COFA nations who are currently renegotiating their compacts of free association as we speak. That's what I'm saying, Troy, this is what I mean. We have to be exceedingly concrete or we're just all talking, 
You know, we're just all, but this is what our students need to see. They need to be able to be sort of imaginative and to have like larger political imaginations because we don't just need legal imaginations. We need political ones. We need to understand like right now there is concrete assistance that these Kofi nations need. And that's something that Hawaii being the premier law school in the region should be helping to pump out. Sorry, that's really specific, but I think that's a more helpful answer than a generic one, you know? No, I, I appreciate that. And I, and I, and I like that. One of the questions gets to, you know, back to the discussion of militarism. Um, I went to Guam a couple of years ago, first time there, reminded me a lot of home um, here in Hawaii. I was taken aback by the military presence. Personally, I was taken aback by the military presence in Guam. Um, can you expand on the military buildup currently underway and, you know, what successes, if any, that the community, that community advocacy is having in that area yeah. yeah well again that's sort of a big question um i we, know we're full of big questions today yeah, I know. <laughs> wow. uh, no but the, the you know the community has been struggling since roughly 2006 this has been a long-standing sort of journey you know i mean the fact that the military bill that hasn't actually already fully happened is testament to a lot of the pushback from you know the ground up, you know the community, uh, just just hundreds of actions, hundreds of actions from vigils and protests and blocking the road and lawsuits, you know. I mean, but that's like been you know just a the, the been pretty obvious. Like that's an obvious thing to say is that the the activist movement has really sort of widened, you know, and gained numbers over the years um, and made some you know really, you know. Um, remarkable successes, but also it's it's just you're dealing with um, you know clearly a beast that just keeps getting fed. You know, I mean, my God, Congress and you know the the Pentagon's bloated budget is just a clear problem. Um, you know, we are redirecting so much of the national resources to this, to this like constant spreading canopy of war. You know, and it's and 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 it's so concrete here because it's not just. I'll give you an example, China recently um, launched uh, four ballistic missiles into the South China Sea, one of which it nicknamed Guam Killer. That is like what we sort of are, it's very uh, concrete for us here, you know? And then the US comes back and then there, and then there, our governor was on the phone with Trump at the time, it was just back and forth. And this is how it is. It's just like Guam being just like this little tiny piece, you know, that can so easily break off. You know, and, and, and so I think one of the things that activists needs to do a lot, a much better job of is making common cause and linking with the activist movements right now. And all of them, we should be like right now at the line three protest, right, right now. <laughs> like, I mean, that's clear because so many of these struggles are similar, you know, like, I mean, I mean, all of them, we can just go off. Like the, there was a recent op-ed, you know, opposing the military land leases in Hawaii. You know, there, we already know about Mauna Kea, but there's also the line three um, just, uh, of uh, just a wide range of projects. Um, right now, Progressive International just came back. We sent a delegation to the Amazon uh, because the indigenous, the leading indigenous groups were opposing President Bolsonaro you know, who's committing genocide. And we also, there was also a case filed, a, you know, a genocide case filed him in The Hague. So we are, there's just like a massive amount of things that are happening. But I think Guam, we definitely, um, we are off so many people's radar. We're so, you know, it's like out of sight, out of mind. We are just not getting the coverage, you know, when like so many of the national leftist activists, even demilitarization groups don't really cover Guam. I mean, groups are doing a better job now, Troy, but it's been a really long road. I mean, Guam gets left out of so many things. And I think it's because, I, I don't know, I can't speculate, but it, it's a problem. Yeah, well, I think your book does a good job of bringing to light a lot of these issues and uh, shameless plug for everybody. <laughs> pump this book out because it really does put Guam squarely at the heart of um, justice issues, all types of justice issues. And it's a really well-written book. Um, do you have any plans to continue writing more books in the future? Like I'm the sure. I, I think I do. I don't know how many more stories you can tell, but. <laughs> well, I actually just finished an essay, which I just pitched to the Atlantic um, just the other day. It's an essay on climate change. Um, in light of the IPCC report, but also like I just feel like there's 
you know, there's a really specific argument that I wanted to make. And so I've been working on it for a few weeks and um, we should know by next week if they're going to take it. Um, also, I have an update just to share with friends. I can't see at all who's on here, but I know Jocelyn. So I assume some of my other friends are here. But basically the other week I, um, I found out that Tommy Orange, that uh, he's an amazing Native American writer, um, Cheyenne and Arapaho, he, um, he wrote There, There just a really phenomenal book um, recently. And he gave the book to his agent, um, um, the Ragi Agency in New York. Um, and they reached out and they signed me last week. So I'm now an Araji author, um, which is pretty freaking exciting. Um, so for sure, they want me to write another book. So I think I will, you know, uh, if I can find enough time between, you know, things. <laughs> well, congratulations. That, that, is, that is really exciting. That is it makes my heart feel warm because you totally deserve that. Um, continuing on that path, uh, we have a comment. I had so many visceral responses to your book, intimate, embodied experiences. In fact, I could visualize them on screen. The two children in the back of the bus are walking down the dusty road. Is there any chance your book or elements of it will continue on in other forms? Thought about that? Wow, your no. Career. Who's that? <laughs> Troy, where are you seeing all these questions right do don't I just worry not, about it just I, answer the questions <laughs> no I obviously I I would I I don't know I can't even answer that I have no I just feel like the most honest thing to say at this point is that I am almost spectacularly open to possibility I I, I don't really have a plan um I'm sufficiently happy being a pra practicing attorney I'm sufficiently happy writing um and I don't really know. I don't know if I even have to necessarily choose one or the other. Um, it, may, it may be that I put down the law for a year or two to focus on a work, um, a work of art. Um, I, I'm not sure, but I, I definitely feel called to keep writing, so. Well, we, we look forward definitely to more of these works. I'm gonna read another comment here. Your chapter, um, My Mother's Bamboo Bracelets, A Handful of Lessons on Saving the World was extremely poignant. You talk about everyone having this sort of responsibility for rescuing the world and later mention how people are reluctant to come to the rescue when they haven't encountered the magic of the world. How do we get people to come to the world's rescue regardless of receiving its magic? Wow, that's a really tough question. I'm a, of and of course, third year law student. <laughs> of course it was, some brilliant law student, damn. No, but uh, no, but the truth is we all we're all compelled in different ways, you know, we're so unique in that way. What moves me doesn't necessarily move someone else. I mean, for me, I just have a very sort of like, I would say rather capacious or wide ability to be moved by beauty. I feel consistently moved by beauty. It's beauty really that gets me up in the morning and that that I'm attentive to to beauty in, in a way that like really propels me and my work forward, you know, um, but not everyone is, you know, some people are able to, you know, confront injustice without that sort of without the aesthetic without, you know, being moved in an emotional way. But honestly, I'm, I'm a very sentient person, you know, like if I could, I would actually rehabilitate the word sentimental, what it really means proceeding from feeling, I proceed from feeling I do. I still do. I have my entire life and that will never change. And that doesn't mean I haven't become, you know, I haven't like I'm that I'm not engaged in masterfully wielding the law as a skill. I'm in, obsessively engaged in being a damn good lawyer as well. But I just understand the law's limitations and I understand them and see them so clearly. I can almost always see the law as this fully formed co thing, you know, and I see it and I move it around and I can manipulate it and wield it. You know, and but it's not enough for me. It's not, I mean, it's not capable of moving me in the way that either either beauty or being actively engaged in community struggle is, you know. So is that the answer to how you bridge the world is staying yeah. connected and then the relationships uh, that you've spoke of earlier? Yeah, I think so. Honestly, Troy, I think I think like like I, you know, get off the couch and get to work when I'm, you know, moved by, and not just by beauty, but when I see my friends, my beloved community, like, you know, like there are people in Hawaii, if they were really in trouble, 
I would literally immediately come to their aid because we have a relationship. And I think that's another thing that we need to start realizing, you know, we have to be solidarity has is solidarity is a verb, you know, like it, it requires work, like nurturing the relationships, you know, that's why I joined, agreed to join Progressive International because, you know, it's just a group of people who are, you know, trying so hard um, to sort of like match the moment that we're in, you know, the scale of the crisis that we're in, to mobilize resources, to hotspots all over the world, you know, where people like in the Amazon, the indigenous peoples there are fighting for their lives, yeah. you know? And so of course we have to go there. And it's love and it's solidarity and it's, you know, kinship and fellowship. It's all of those things. And if, honestly, like if love can't save this place, I really don't know if anything can, you know? Yeah. Wow. I know you get this. I do. I, I, you're just amazing. I mean, this is like powerful stuff. I love it. Um, more questions from the audience. Along with being more imaginative, what is your biggest advice to the next generation, to your law students, to lawyer, young lawyers out there? What's your biggest advice to them? That's tough too. I kind of have two answers, Troy. I, and it's That's only cool. tough because I'm, I'm really thinking about the question, you know? Um, I think one is you kind of have to hold the space for a certain kind of tension in your life. On the one hand, in the face of injustice, the absolutely most important thing is impatience, right? Because the time for justice is always now. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you are in, you've chosen this profession, you're in law school, right? So you, you went there for a reason. So my advice to young law students would be, if you're in it, be in it all the way. Like you can't just go that, you know, like, I mean, and I, I see this all the time. I saw it when I was a st law student and I, I saw it for the last 10 years adjuncting, you know, there's this also this inclination among would be activists, activist leaning students, right? They're so quick to just like, you know, bemoan the problems of the world. And they're like, not really studying either. Like, so they're like, they're at school, they're spending all of this money to obtain, you know, a Juris Doctorate and get this skill set, but they're not actually trying as hard as they can. And I know for a fact that that's not true, that they are not trying as hard as they can. But because, and in part because they're so overwhelmed, you know, by sort of this notion that they're having to put off being an active part of the world while they're in school. One, they don't have to, they can do it all. They can be active in community and be active in various sort of social justice related campaigns, but they should actually aim to be masterful I like when I have students, when I teach at Richardson, I, I am always on my students, like white on rice. I am always on them. I was like, if you have chosen to already be here, be here, you know, and be excellent. Don't coast. This is not, there's no time for this. If you claim to want to save the world, you have to be the best. You have to be excellent. At the very least, you have to insist on it. You have to strive for it. It's, it's effort, you know? Yeah, it's volition, it's choice. They have to see that and they have to work really hard. I mean, too many of our students are not, you know, that's not, a, you know, that's not good when, you know, all these would be amazing change agents and activist lawyers actually, you know, not are not actually graduating with as much skill as they need to do it well. And so like, I always just, I disallow my students to be lazy. I love that. Good. Let's, um, I think this might be the last question. And sure. it's one of those uh, bigger questions too. <laughs> what is your image of the postmodern Pacific Island? Wow. Okay. Um, I. Well, let me let me frame sure. it another way. Let me frame yeah. it another way. What is what is your vision of Guam and the Pacific? What would be your ideal vision oh, for, okay. for first Guam of all? Yeah. First of all, the obvious answer is for there to no longer be contemporary colonies. For all of the colonies in the Pacific to decolonize, that would be a dream, you know, like French Polynesia, Guam, West Papua. I mean, you know, there's several, I mean, even CNMI status should be, there's so many things that I would do just at that level. That would be a dream to see a decolonized Pacific, but also a Pacific that's just really, really intersectional, and that operates from a place of solidarity in every way, you know, and also one where we're also reaching for excellence again. I mean, in every way, like we're, when we're even holding each other accountable, when we 
because it's not only about saying, oh, outside forces did this to us, you know, and we're still reeling from those consequences. Of course, that is true, but it's not enough. If we really are serious, we have to hold each other accountable for our own moral failings as well. You know, Nauru needs to be held accountable right now for aiding and abetting Australia's battery of human rights abuses. There are human rights abuses happening there as sort of part and parcel to Australia's offshore detention center. And that means that we have to not look Nauru in the face and say, this is not okay. And Nauruans have to look themselves in the mirror and say, this is not who we are. So we have to do that at every level, you know? I mean, but that's my, that's my goal. I'm not just a, just a formally decolonized place, but just a, a, a region that understands, you know, that it's more, it's more than that. It's more than just an act of political, you know, decolonization. It's a, about understanding that what, I don't know, something that Toni Morrison said, you know, the function of freedom is to free someone else. Anyway, I hope that makes sense. That, well, I would say that that's a great way to end it, but I don't want to end it yet. And I think we actually have seven minutes. So I'm going to keep going, Julian. <laughs> oh, man, Troy, that feels like a lot. Just kidding. I can't see anything. I think my computer's jacked up or I can't really... Am I not supposed to see these questions or you just No, they, you should be able to see the question. So one more oh, wow. came in. It says, um, Julie, this is from Lori Tochiki. Um, what? It's Dean from who? Tochiki, Dean Tochiki, Lori Tochiki. And she says, Julian, I remember that when you started law school, you yearned to be in the Ululehua program. <laughs> do you remember that? If you do remember, can you share what was attractive about the program to you? Oh God, I begged her. I begged Dean Tochiki. I would just be like a little boy. I'd just run up to her, begging her to let me in. You know, I was like, please. <laughs> <laughs> let me into this program because it's just the camaraderie, you know, that I sort of imagined was happening from the outside looking in, you know, um, they just had each other, you know, it was just such a, I don't know, such a, such an intentional community, you know, um, and, and from what I was told, um, sort of Ulilahua scholars were brought in and sort of assembled, not only, or just for a, a variety of reasons, but one of them was because that they had um, social justice inclinations, that they all, you know, had this sort of shared sense, you know, that the law is about, you know, this. So that's why I really wanted in. And of course, Dean Chochiki did not let me in, but <laughs> just You're but officially she, a member of the Lehua family. No, but she was, and, but also just, just, to, just to smile and just give her a compliment, honestly, Troy, this, she's an example of what's so special about Richardson. She would just walk around, I, I like float almost around and just like be so um, helpful to the students. I mean, she was really so, like, like a, a remarkable woman. I'll never forget. She was so supportive of me and, you know, and other, other, other people were too. Um, but I think that the Richardson nurtures in us a respect, not only for possibilities, but also for each other. There is a sense of, um, there is a sense of respect, you know, that is nurtured there that I don't see in other schools, in many other schools, and I've lectured at many of them, and I don't necessarily see them. At least not, it doesn't rise to a level of an ethos. And Lord Jachiki, for example, walks around with an ethos. She has a worldview, you know, and that worldview is about caretaking, and it's abundantly clear. I love it, I love it. Um, we'll go with this will be for sure the last question. Okay, I'm holding what you to your, What is your favorite piece in this book that you just published? What's your favorite and why? Honestly, Troy, that's changed a couple times. Um, right now, right now, in this moment, what, what's your No, I think, I think it's gone back to the original favorite. Um, I think it's Zugu means yoke. I think that's the piece that really, I don't know, I think if there's something indelible about it, especially for me, because because um, that piece is about a spectacularly vulnerable moment in my life. But I also believe it is in that vulnerability. It is at precisely that moment that a writer is born. Because, the, and, I, and I do believe that so much. And so I shared that with, you know, with the world, with the readers, but it, it really was intimate, you could say. It's very personal. Um, and I think that's my favorite. I love that. Well. Julian, it's been really an honor and a pleasure to have this conversation with you. Um, this book is a gem and a gift to really the world and you should be really proud. We're all over here really proud of you. And um, 
wanting you to come to Hawaii, one, back to Hawaii one day to talk to all of us in person. But again, thank you to everyone there in the audience. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I wish you all a very happy and safe weekend. We will um, be sending out a survey. Please feel free to uh, let us know what you thought of this program. If you have any questions, we have some uh, time left. You can put things in the chat for um, the co-sponsors. You can look at our links for the different co-sponsors. You can purchase your book by clicking on a link here. Um, but Julian, thank you. Mahalo. And, thank you so much for having me, Troy. Thank you very all. Very good to see you. You too. Be well. You too, my friend. Aloha.